Awesome, no. لا 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 هذا في خير جاي والله كيف حالك كيف اخبارك بخير ان شاء الله ما شاء الله تلاوه الله يبارك ما شاء الله تلاوه رهيب الله يتقبل منك Alright, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh everybody. Assalamu alaikum. How is everybody? How are you guys feeling today? Alhamdulillah, great. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa minulah. Amma ba'd. You see, uh, we've been told that rizq is, uh, is, you know, is only money. Wealth. When you get money, you get wealth, that's rizq. But subhanallah, that's only part, that's a small part of rizq. But part of the rizq that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, gives you the opportunity to, uh, to be enlightened about an issue like the issue of Palestine, subhanAllah, without even expecting it, right? Probably you saw the flyer just yesterday uh, when Brother Asfar, mashallah, said that uh, Brother Mujib, jazallah khayran, uh, has given us this, uh, this wonderful opportunity to host our khuna, uh, Brother Sami Hamdi, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, to talk to us about the current situation because this is, Brother Sami, this is everybody's talk nowadays, right? Uh, to be honest, uh, when I talk to our, you know, my fellow Imams, everyone is seeing that they're finding it very difficult to prepare in khutbah nowadays. Because when, when you think of talking about any different topic, it's just difficult, right? You feel like, come on, you don't know. That's not what you should talk to people about. So we've been talking about Palestine, about Gaza, and, and, you know, and what's going on over there. So Alhamdulillah, I mean, we have the opportunity to... Um, to alhamdulillah to listen and discuss this important topic with uh, brother Sami Hamdi, mashallah. Uh, he is the editor in chief, uh, chief of the international uh, interest and experience uh, geopolitical risk consultant. He has extensive experience in the uh, MENA, which is Middle East, North Africa region. Uh, just learned this from him, mashallah. Uh, he has uh, been a television reporter and talk show host for over 10 years. Alhamdulillah, he's coming all the way from London, right? You live in the UK? In the UK. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah. Barakallahu feekum. So, uh, we're honored to have him, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, and also uh, Brother Mujib Kazi, Alhamdulillah. You see him all over the place. Whenever there's anything related to the Muslim community, Brother Kazi, Brother Mujib is always there. He is uh, the president of North Texas Islamic uh, Council, MashaAllah, and he's doing a wonderful job. And actually, he was the main, Alhamdulillah, reason why. Uh, we're, we're, we're here and we're sitting to listen to Brother Sami, mashallah, rabbil alameen. So with that being said, I will uh, hand it over to Brother, Brother Mujib, you want to start, inshallah, um, with, uh, inshallah, start the discussion. So I would like to ask the brothers and sisters to uh, listen attentively, inshallah, rabbil alameen, so you can benefit. Are we allowing uh, any Q&A? Are you, are you comfortable with Q&A at the end? Q&A, inshallah. If you have any questions, inshallah, just... Keep it for now, and we will give you a chance, inshallah. We're here till Fajr, right? Is it Fajr? 
الفجر الفجر ان شاء الله بسم الله ضحى ان شاء الله بارك الله فيكم تفضل الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على سيد الانبياء والمرسلين yesterday afternoon i was approached about this opportunity the first person i reached out to was brother asfar and one of the sister and he was the first one to say that he would be more than happy to host brother sami here today so this notice was literally less than 24 hour notice and we just simply cannot thank enough our beautiful community at frisco and uh, brother asfar and his team brother asfar and his team for being gracious and hospitable as he has been for for all the noble causes and of course our dear imam imam salah who has been always supportive of any good work that our community needs so this we are, we owe you a bunch of thanks and jazakallah khairan for giving us the opportunity so every household as sheikh salah has mentioned every household whether we are uh, following the faith of islam or any other faith for the most part the epicenter of discussion is what's going on in palestine and we are at at a stage at a crossroad where we simply don't know how to educate ourselves that's number 1 educate our children that's number 2 and then how can we educate our communities across where we live where we work with them where we you know interact with them go to school and what have you so this opportunity couldn't have been better that we have an expert on the subject and the one who is very well aware of the situation that's happening at the ground zero and not only that he advised to the government and and he can speak his words can speak volume and then we are very humble and thankful for uh, brother sami to be up here today with us and 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 we want to make sure that we take advantage of his presence inshallah i would uh, like to ask him to begin with what is his reflection when it comes down to the hypocrisy of the world towards this issue particularly the muslim world Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala sayyidina Rasulullah. First of all, assalamu alaykum everybody. Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi. I'll let you know when the Sami that they've described has walked through the door and I'll give him the mic inshallah. Jazakum Allah al khair. Barakallahu fikum for having me. Barakallahu fikum for extending the invitation. And barakallahu fikum for getting me out of the hotel room. First and foremost, I would like to stress as I always do whenever any praise is showered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Fatir, مَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ الْعِزَّةَ فَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ جَمِيعًا Anybody who seeks glory, let them know all glory belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ayah is written in a way in which there is no qualification. Allah makes it absolutely clear, all glory belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So any resonance you find in my words, that is by the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I have seen that when people make mistakes or they say something that is contrary to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, The Ummah as a self-regulating body acknowledges that and denounces and condemns that as well. And the reason why I say that is to appreciate and to demonstrate an understanding that what you're resonating with is the cause, not with Samuel Hamdi. You're resonating with justice, not with Samuel Hamdi. You're resonating with what is right, not with Samuel Hamdi. Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anh said that truth is not determined by men, but the character of men is determined as to whether they stand by the truth and the reference to men here also refers to every Muslim or Muslima as well. So, having got that out of the way, I think that when it comes to the hypocrisy with regards to the coverage of Palestine and, and what's happening in Gaza today, I think all the masks now have slipped. I think that the idea now that somehow the world was divided between one orbit that preached human rights and one orbit that preached violent and essentially the opposite of human rights i think now it's become abundantly clear that the, we have one global order where there is one vision which is human rights when it suits them no human rights when it doesn't suit them the point here being is that when russia entered ukraine the narrative was that the war in ukraine was about trying to rescue 
a, quote, rules-based order, that the reason that Ukraine needed to be supported, and I do believe they should be supported, by the way, and I explain why, the, the narrative was that we need to support Ukraine because we need to uphold a rules-based order. Because if Russia wins, then we will not have a world of law. And then Gaza happened, and Gaza demonstrated beyond all uh, doubt that there is no such thing as a rules-based order. In If it comes to you, you celebrate. If it doesn't come to you, you tell everybody to stay away from it. On the caveat, the reason why I said that Ukraine should be supported is because I was in Sarajevo when Putin invaded Ukraine, capital of Bosnia, known as the Jerusalem of Europe. Notice how the Muslim capital or, or, or the Muslim city at the heart of Europe is what Europeans call the Jerusalem of Europe, which gives you an indication that Islam produced the ideal coexistence of religions in Europe not the values that Europe insists that it stands by or it espouses. But I was in Sarajevo when Putin invaded uh, Kiev, invaded Ukraine, and the Bosnians, there was a sense that they were beginning to prepare to go to war. The Muslims in Bosnia were becoming agitated and they were telling each other that this time we will all need to go and join the army and prepare for war because they said, if Putin enters Kiev, Serbia will invade Bosnia and try another genocide of the Muslims. For those of you who stand up and celebrate Putin and Russia and claim that Russia rising is a good thing, let me remind you that in the 1990s, when the UN imposed an arms embargo on Bosnia, preventing the Muslims from having weapons to resist the Serbian attempt to commit genocide against the Muslims, the Europeans supplied weapons to the Christian Croats, Russia supplied weapons to the Serbs to commit their genocide, not all the Serbs, I'm talking about the fascist Serbs because there were Muslim Serbs who fought with the Bosnians as well. But Russia supplied the weapons to Mladic and Karadzic to embark on their genocide, while the UN embargo only really applied to the Muslims. They were the only group who were unable to secure the weapons. Bismillah, mashallah. They were the only group who were unable to secure the weapons. So for those of you who think that as a result of Gaza, we should now support Ukraine, it's not about the Ukrainians themselves, it's about what it means if Putin wins in Ukraine. Putin wins in Ukraine, your brothers and sisters in Bosnia are next. Remember that when you are analyzing the politics of what's happening. In terms of the hypocrisy, in terms of what we're seeing, it has become absolutely clear, but for a particular reason. And this is, I'm approaching it this way in order to push back against the argument made by Muslims that we should not be engaging in the politics of the country. When you look at the statesmen in the U.S. administration today, you will find that the Secretary of State is a man called Antony Blinken, who hails from a family that supports Zionism. You will find that the National Security Advisor is Jake Sullivan, who hails from a family that supports Zionism. You will find that the spokesman of the White House is John Kirby, who hails from a family that supports Zionism. That the families who share these ideologies pushed their children to get involved, to engage, so that they would finally reach positions whereby they would be able to deploy the resources of the most powerful nation on earth for the sake of the settler colonialist project that they support, even when that's against the interest of the United States itself. The United States of America objectively has no interest in burning all of its bridges with the Middle East population, burning its bridges with the Muslim populations at a time when it needs them to push back against Russia, which is going into Ukraine and trying to challenge US hegemony everywhere. The United States of America objectively has no interest. There is no, it is not in US interest to alienate a Muslim population when China is trying to go to them and say, support me so I can take down U.S. interests in the rest of the continent. By all objective measures, you, the support of the United States of America for Israel makes no political or economic sense. Even the taxpayers' money that should be going towards addressing the economic crisis here in the United States, where they don't find money to clear up the tents. I went to Beverly Hills in L.A. expecting to see 
you know, Beverly Hills Cop, Eddie Murphy, I, I, I grew up watching that, and I, I went to LA and I thought, you know, oh my God, I'm gonna see all the movie scenes and everything. I was really excited. When I got to Beverly Hills, I just find a string of tents with homeless people. But they are not important. Israel is more important. $14 billion instead of rectifying homelessness, they send it to a settler colonialist project that is geared towards dispossessing the people of land and homes because somehow they believe they have a thousands and thousands year old right to the piece of land. If we accept that the Zionists have a thousand year old claim to the land of Palestine, Spain should be given back to the Muslims because the Muslims were there 800 years. The current people in Spain were only there 600 years. Maybe we should go make a claim for Spain. <laughs> But Spain are standing with the Palestinians. So Spain, barakallahu fikum. Muchos gracias. So, when it comes to why the U.S. supports Israel, it's not based on political or economic interest. It's based on ideologues who managed to get to the highest levels of state and are now wielding the state resources for the sake of their own ideology. So much so that even when the Democrats are falling in the polls, still Antony Blinken and these other ideologues are insisting that they should keep supporting the Israelis because for them Israel is more important than even their own positions here in the United States. The only one who is upset about it is Biden. Biden now and Kamala Harris are now arguing with each other. Biden is saying, don't panic too much about the Muslim vote. Yes, somehow their Allah has made it that the swing states that will decide the election, the Muslims happen to be the deciding vote in at least four of those swing states. Look how Allah has put power in your hands. You are 1% of the population, but suddenly now he's given you the power of 51%. The swing, he could have made any of the swing states, he could have made any other state the deciding vote. Allah chose to make it in the states where the Muslims are the deciding vote. And for those of you who want to appreciate it in terms of numbers, Axios reported that if even 100,000 Muslims, just 100,000, if they abandon Biden, Biden loses the election. If even 100,000 Muslims abandon Biden, a sliver, they said, sliver, for those who don't know what sliver means, when you have a toast and a slice of bread where you put the butter, little sliver. Biden loses the election. Biden is now concerned, which is why Kamala Harris came out and said that she did a video on her Twitter feed and she said, we've come up with this amazing project. It's a new project, unprecedented, to counter Islamophobia. Nobody's ever done it before. As if, now I ask you, did, do you think that project came about because Kamala Harris woke up and said, la hawla wa la, she doesn't, she doesn't say that, but <laughs> stop making that joke. But do you think Kamala Harris woke up and said, these poor, poor Palestinians, or these poor, poor Muslim Americans, we need to counter Islamophobia because the Muslims in Dallas are feeling hurt? No. So why did she do it? She did it because they sat on a table of Democrats. And the Democrats said, guys, we're looking at the polls, and the polls are suggesting that these Muslims are really serious about not voting for us in November. And so Biden said, you know, we're giving doing scenarios here. Biden said, look, let's throw them a bone that they can chew on. Cause some divisions between them. Let's tell them counter Islamophobia to show that their only hope is with us Democrats. And then they sent an email out, for those of you who are subscribed to the Democrat Party, which is Trump wants to do the Muslim ban. We stand against the Muslim ban. Allah, Allah, Allah. And then Hind Mekki, uh, activist of Sudanese origin in the US, she's American. She put a tweet out and she said, they are trying to scare us with Trump. I'd like to inform the Democrats that we Muslims survived four years of Trump already. 15,000 Palestinians did not survive four years of Biden. Scaring us with Trump won't work. The point here being is that Biden is clearly concerned. Now the reason that Biden is still holding on despite your anger is because Biden is aware there is a trend amongst the Muslims in which when November comes, when they find the choice between Trump and Biden, they will panic and they will go and vote Biden because they will say he's ahwan al-sharrain. They, they believe that when Muslims go to a ballot box, they will see a genocide enabler versus a racist, and they will believe that the racist is less than the genocide enabler. They will go to the ballot box and they will see that Trump, who is immoral, who, is, who does horrible things, that Trump is worse than somebody who supported the ethnic cleansing and genocide of Gaza. That's what Biden believes. And I met an advisor of Rashida Tlaib when I was in Stanford a few, a few weeks back. 
And she said something interesting. She said that when Rashida went to Biden's office, she told him, guys, look, the Muslims are going to abandon you. You're going to lose in these swing states. You need to call for a ceasefire. You need to alter and change. And apparently one of the advisors laughed at her and said, Rashida, where are they going to go? The Muslims will forget by November. They'll vote for us anyway. We're not really, it's, it's, it's not as much of a problem as you think it is. And that's why part of my agreement to come to the US was to try to see and look in your eyes and see to what extent you are committed to punishing genocide Joe or to what extent you believe that the comforts that you enjoy are not worth sacrificing for the sake of Palestine and Gaza. I came to see and look in your eyes and see and try to see if the fear of Trump that you have is worth supporting Biden and telling him, Biden, yes, you committed a genocide, but I'm so scared of Trump that go. I was about to say, took Allah, but it was, it was it just go. You committed genocide, we hate you for it, but we'll still give you a second term. Trample on us. Oh, by the way, uh, the views expects, expressed by the speaker reflect those of the speaker himself and do not, respect, do not represent those of the organization that invited him. They did not ask me what I was going to say. I did not tell them what I was going to say. They probably should have asked me what I was going to say. But irregardless, they have nothing to do with what's being said here. Everything that I say is my opinion alone and I'd like to make that absolutely clear. And uh, please let me come into America again when I come on my next trip with my <laughs> visa. To wrap up on the question that was asked about the hypocrisy and the double standards, there's another reason that the hypocrisy and double standards has been exposed. There are two dynamics here that I want to go towards. The first is, this is the first time where we see a Palestinian generation that is now fluent in English. And this is no disrespect to the elders who came before, but think about it this time. Hussam Zumlut, Mustafa Barghouthi, Noor Aliqat, Muhammad Al-Kurd, Hind Al-Khudari, Mu'taz Azayza, Plastia, you're all following these people. Each time they were brought onto a media channel and they were said, do you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn Hamas? Hussein Zumlut gave a wonderful answer. He said, I reject the premise of the question. He said, look how many Palestinians were killed by the Israeli settlers over the past few months, but you only drag me in here when Israelis are killed. You don't care about the Palestinians, so your question is not sincere. And I will not adopt the premise. And I saw Hussein Zumlut today give an interview in Al Jazeera where he was asked an extended interview. They asked him, why don't you answer that question and just say you condemn? He goes, because the reason they're asking that question is not because they care about what happened on October 7th. They're asking that question to put you on the defensive to delegitimize your argument, which is that the Palestinians are entitled to their land and to legitimate rights. The first reason why that hypocrisy has been exposed is because Bismillah, MashaAllah, La Quwata Illa Billah, this is a very eloquent generation. And that's why I always say that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَالُوا مِمَّا دَعِي لَاللَّهُ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Is there no better speech than one who calls to Allah and does good deeds and say, I am from the Muslims? Let's be honest, when you read that ayah, in its very spiritual sense, you imagine a nice green grass area where you're standing giving da'wah, it's all nice, it's all merry, come to Islam. Oh, is that your Quran? Oh, it's lovely, please tell me more about it. Oh, is this your prophet? Is this, oh my God, like you know. But Allah tells you what da'wah is really like in the following ayah. And I only realized this when I went to LA a couple of months back and they opened the, 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 the session with Quran and I, had, and I didn't realize that these two ayah actually follow each other. Which is, وَلَا تَسْتَوِ الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيِّئَةُ إِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ Allah tells you what da'wah is really like. He says the good deed and the bad deed are not equal. And it follows the ayah of da'wah, which means that when someone is hostile to you and does something horrible to you it doesn't mean you do something horrible to them for the bad deed and the good deed are not equal that's why when Umar Mukhtar the legendary Libyan leader when they captured Italian soldiers his followers said yeah Sheikh let's do to them what they do to us let's torture them the way they torture us let's electrocute them the way they electrocute us let's cut their limbs the way they cut our limbs let's kill them the way they kill them and Umar Mukhtar said absolutely not and they got angry with Umar Mukhtar they said why he said they are not our teachers our teachers are the beloved Prophet, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and those who came before him. That's what I mean by They show racism, we are not racist. They show Islamophobia, we are not anti-Semitic. We don't respond in the same of their level. That's part of da'wah. Allah put that ayah as part of da'wah, suggesting da'wah is not just calling. Da'wah is in the way that you respond to people who are coming against you. And the proof is that Allah says, conduct yourself in that which is best. For the one with whom is you, the one who is your enemy today, tomorrow might become your warmest ally. 
That's what da'wah is. Da'wah is to somebody as well who is your enemy today. And as a result of your da'wah, your eloquence, your strategy, the way you approach, the way you raise awareness, the way you patiently go on to this course, you will see that the one who is your enemy today becomes your closest ally. Ibadallah, put your hand up if you saw our Jewish cousins do the sitting in the Congress. Now imagine if people who look like me did the sitting in the Congress and what the reaction would have been. Put your hand up if you saw the Jewish cousins at the protest denouncing what Israel is doing. Put your hand up if you've seen the videos of the Jewish cousins coming out denouncing Palestine. Put your hand up if you've seen those coming out, the videos where they say, yesterday I was pro-Israel, today I'm pro-Palestine because I'm seeing now what they're doing. Is this not, Are they not today our warmest allies in delivering it? Did Allah not deliver that? And that's why Allah says, وَمَا يُلَقَاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا The only ones who achieve this are those who are patient. Let me ask you, if you had given up on the first week in terms of raising your awareness for Palestine and being on social media and shouting about it, do you think you would have achieved the shift? You wouldn't have. If you'd given up in the second week, would you have achieved it? No. Third week, you wouldn't have achieved it. Fourth week, no. You showed the sub you showed that perseverance despite the fact that you didn't know whether you could achieve the outcome or not and Allah is now showing how the, those who once stood against us are now becoming our warmest allies that's why when we talk about the exposing of the hypocrisy and the double standards it's been brought about by the eloquence of the Palestinians but also by you who refused to be quiet and kept raising your voices for Palestine so how do we address the double standards and the hypocrisy to wrap up on this question and I promise I'll finish on this point with regards to the question even though that's become a meme now but in any case I think that when it, when it comes to hypocrisy and double standards, the reason it's been exposed is because you raised your voice. The reason it's been exposed is because you wouldn't be quiet. And wallahi, I tell you, if you had been quiet, those double standards and hypocrisy would have been still today be called professionalism and journalistic standards. And that's something that at least you should celebrate and should also give you incentive to keep going as you are. Uh, if you don't mind. Um, so part of the question, uh, it was about the, uh, the hypocrisy in the Arab world as well, right? So I just came back from Egypt, and I can tell you, I, I, I see the Egyptian people are very frustrated. And they know that, unfortunately, there is nothing much they can do about it for the time being. So, Brother Sami, how would you explain the, 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 the position of the Egyptian, um, the current Egyptian uh, regime? Because for some pe people are very confused. You know, CC is refusing to accept uh, the people from Gaza, obviously, to, you know, to, to move to Sinai, right? So how, how do you see the situation over there? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I'd like to state for the record <laughs> that the that the op I'd like, because I said it to the Americans, now I say it to the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and Sisi. The, 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 the opinions that I'm about to express and that I've expressed before are my opinions alone. And okay, I'm paying the price I, for I it. I still go to Egypt. That's so, yeah. fine, yeah, that, that's fine. But for everybody here, they are innocent of it. I am the mutarabbis who is talking to them. They are innocent of everything I'm about to say. Please let them do Umrah and let them get through the Jeddah airport to go to. They have nothing to do with my crimes between quotation marks the reason why I say that I say that semi-jokingly but in reality I'm half serious as well in fact I'm 90% serious the reason being is that when Blinken went to Tel Aviv in the first week or second week after what happened in Gaza Blinken went to Tel Aviv and you'll remember that when he landed he said I'm here as a Jew as if somehow the Holocaust happened in the Middle East or the Spanish Inquisition happened in Tunis or the, the Warsaw pogrom in Poland happened in Jordan. As if the Balfour Declaration, in which Balfour didn't give it to them as a gift. He just said, I want these aliens out. I don't want Jews in, in Britain. As if somehow the Muslim world had a similar version to Balfour. As if somehow the Jews found sanctuary in Europe, not in the Ottoman Empire or in Andalusia or in the Muslim nations where in history they kept fleeing too because of anti-Semitic Europe and anti-Semitic Caucasians and anti-Semitism that is still rife in Europe and rife in the US as well. That comes not from the Muslims, it comes from Christian Europe and Christ white supremacist Europe. I saw Dr. Hatem Bazian made a joke. He goes, the only black thing that uh, white supremacists don't kill is oil. <laughs> he's lucky he's tenured so, so, 
So when the Blinken went and landed in Tel Aviv and said, I am a Jew, Blinken was supposed to go to Tel Aviv and go back to Washington. And I had journalist friends who were on the plane as well, and they said, we're going to Tel Aviv, I'm going straight back to Washington. But then he changed his mind and he decided to fly to Riyadh, and then fly to Jordan, fly to Egypt, and uh, fly to you know, the, the regional countries. And we sat there as analysts trying to figure out what happened in Tel Aviv that made Blinken decide to go to regional powers. Is he going to present a roadmap? Is he going to present a plan? Is he going to try to come up and talk about Gaza the day after? Is he going to establish an alliance? And the Washington Post reported the next day that Blinken had gone to ask help to, quote, tamp down on public anger. For those who want to know what that means, it means he went to bin Salman and said, yeah, bin Salman, there are these annoying Muslims sitting in Dallas al-Sharif, and they are speaking very loudly about Palestine on social media, and they are amplifying the voices of these Palestinians, and now people who are pro-Israel are starting to doubt Israel's cause. Crown Prince, come on, I need some help here. Bin Salman told him, Abshir, ya tawil Amr, okay, no problem. Let me make a few phone calls. Call me Abdurrahman al Sudais from uh, Mecca. Abdurrahman Sudais. Assalamu alaikum, ya Tawil Omar, how are you? I need fatwa. What, fat, uh, what fatwa do you need? I need a fatwa that will get the Muslims to stop talking about Gaza because Blinken says it's troubling him, and I need a NATO style security agreement against the Iranians. I need nuclear technology to make a nuclear weapon. And I also need support for Vision 2030. Yes, I brought Iggy Azalea and I, and I tried to invite Nicki Minaj, but we need Biden's support to promote Vision 2030 so that we can achieve the economic development that we want. Abshir Yatawil Amr, okay. Abdurrahman al Sudais gave his fatwa in Mecca. He said, Ya Ibad Allah, we make dua for Gaza and we ask Allah to give victory for Gaza, but Ya Ibad Allah, don't talk about this fitna. Don't talk about issues that you don't know. And trust Wulat al-Amr. Trust your leader and trust the scholars that your leader has appointed. They know better than you. And Imam in Suleiman Rajhi Mosque came out and he said in a video, and, and this is exactly what he said. He said, Ya Ibad Allah, your analyses are burdensome. What do you know that the ruler doesn't know? Your opinions are like those of slugs. Trust the ruler, make dua for Gaza, but don't cause fitna with your analyses by talking about this issue. A Turkish friend of mine went to Medina al Munawwara, I won't say who, so that he can get through the border. He went a few weeks ago and he said to me, Sami, I'm going to Medina, but my heart hurts when you tell me they're not allowed to talk about Gaza. I want to go and see if it's true or not. I told him, just be careful, don't message me too much when you're in Saudi, inshallah. He went and he recorded the khutbah in Medina al Munawwara. The Imam standing near the grave of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Imam mentioned Gaza and that's when the brother started recording. He doesn't speak Arabic. May Allah guide him to learn Arabic, inshallah. The, he sent me the voice note and the voice note is 10 minutes long. I won't play it for you. But the Imam says, Ya Ibad Allah, our hearts are bleeding for Gaza. But beware the mutarabbi seen who are going around trying to turn you against a ruler. Trust your rulers. Trust your rulers that they know what they are doing with regards to Gaza. When Israel cuts the internet connection on Gaza, on the day Israel begins its ground offensive, trust that there is hikmah in bringing Shakira to dance in Riyadh on that night. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. That's me who said it. That's me. He didn't say that. I'm just giving the translation of effectively the implementation of what he said. Because Shakira danced in Riyadh on the night that Israel began its ground invasion. On the night that Mu'taz Aziz and Yaz reported that the internet was cut off and Israeli tanks entered Gaza, Shakira was strutting her stuff in Riyadh. Hips don't lie, I guess. <laughs> so the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman sat down with his advisors. And here is where well, let's put morality aside and just talk strict politics. Muhammad bin Salman sat down with his advisors and he will have calculated where his interests lie. Bin Salman says that, I don't have a board, but okay. That this is Saudi Arabia. To the north, I have Hashd al-Shaabi, 23 militias loyal to Iran that have fired rockets at me in the past, including towards the royal palace. The Hashd al-Shaabi, 23 militias were led by a man called Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis. Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis was assassinated by Donald Trump in 2019 alongside Qasem Soleimani. Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis in 2019 went to give a talk to Iranians, to students in Iran, 
And the students in Iran said to him in a video that went viral, they said to him, you are a mujahid of our modern times. One day, inshallah, you will liberate Al-Aqsa. He said, no, no, Riyadh, Riyadh, Riyadh. He said, Riyadh, that's my target first before I go anywhere near Israel. So Bin Salman says the Americans are now making deals with the Iranians. Obama in 2015 said to the Iranians that, that as part of the Iran nuclear deal, your militias can be incorporated into the army. Bin Obama essentially handing over the Iraqi army over to the Iranians as a peace offering for them to agree to a nuclear deal that Trump later blew up. Bin Salman says that these Iraqi militias are threatening me. I'm not in a position to ruin my negotiations with Biden for a NATO-style security agreement so that the Americans can help me resist those militias. I have Iran to the east and I have a Shia population in the east. And every now and then, Iran winds me up by sending a Shia imam to the east of Saudi Arabia who riles them up. You remember Nimr, for example, one of them who was executed by the Saudis. Riled up the Shia, the Iranians are trying to do in Saudi Arabia. This is bin Salman's view. I'm just talking, I'm saying, imagine you're in the room now. Now you're all policy advisors, you're all analysts. You're sitting with the Saudi policymakers. Bin Salman tells you the Iranians might agitate the Shia population in the east as they did in Bahrain. And I sent tanks into Bahrain to rescue the government. I'm worried the Iranians will do the same thing in East. And to the South, you have the Houthis. The Houthis who are now fighting their seventh war since 2004 because they believe it is wajib to fight for Ahl al-Bayt to rule the country. And it is kufr if anybody other than Ahl al-Bayt rules any of the Muslim lands. And Ahl al-Bayt is Abdul Malik al-Houthi and the Houthi family. And therefore, it's wajib to keep fighting. Even when there's a national dialogue that agrees on a government, even if there's a national dialogue that agrees on elections, elections is kufr, we need to fight. Only Sayyid Abdul Malik al-Houthi is allowed to rule the country because that's what our Wilayat al-Faqih teaches us. Bin Salman says, Am I going to jeopardize my negotiations for a security pact with the Americans who have let me down before in 2019 for the sake of Gaza when in reality Palestinians aren't really going to be going anywhere? Okay, Netanyahu will bomb for 80, 90 days, but the Palestinians are not going to leave their lands. They'll survive and they'll stay there. They don't need me to intervene. My stomach hurts after saying all of that disgusting thing, but, but, but you understand where the political side of things he's coming from. Astaghfirullah let me reword it. You understand. What do you understand? These are the political calculations that the Saudis are making. It's not the time to jeopardize relationship with the Americans. Qatar normalized ties with Israel in 1996 by establishing an economic office in Doha. Because of those ties in 1996, the Americans prevented Saudi Arabia from stopping the coup in Qatar. For those who don't know, the Qatari emir, his father was Hamad bin Khalifa. Hamad bin Khalifa had a father who was the emir. This father was sick, went to Switzerland for medical treatment. While the father's getting medical treatment in Switzerland, his son calls him and tells him, Father, I've done a coup, I've taken over. Don't come back to the country, please. That father calls Saudi Arabia and says, My upstart son has done a coup on me. Please get me and restore me to power. Hamad bin Khalifa realizes that the Saudis are preparing an army to invade to restore the father. So Hamad bin Khalifa calls the Americans and tells them, I will let you establish the largest military base in the region and I will establish ties with Israel willingly, not like Jordan and Egypt who did it in a peace agreement. I will establish ties with Israel if you get the Saudis to back off and not invade. And the Americans and the French said, what an opportunity. And they went straight in. They said to the Saudis, don't you dare bomb Qatar. Don't you dare go into Qatar and restore the Emir. So UAE in 2019, they got frustrated. They said these Israelis always defend the Qataris. Even during the blockade, Netanyahu came out and prevented Trump from allowing us to invade Qatar, according to foreign policy. Whether it's true or not, it's a different issue. UAE said Qatar has benefited from its ties with Israel. Netanyahu, I'll one up the Qataris. Qatar gave you economic office and then turned their backs. I'll give you official normalization in exchange for you getting Congress and White House not to comment on any of my foreign policy. When I send a militia in Sudan to rampage, to rape, to loot, to burn cities, to massacre tribal populations, I want you to make sure that Congress and White House do not talk about my role in helping this militia to topple the state and to topple the army. Netanyahu said, easy, no problem, we did it for other countries. I, UAE said, I want that when I support Haftar and he launches an attack on the internationally recognized government in Tripoli, I want you to make sure that the White House gives me the green light. Netanyahu said, sure, no problem. 
Anything else? UAE says we want access to spy technology. Israel says that's a red line. That technology belongs to us. UAE says, okay, I'll settle for. The reason I'm saying all this is, Bin Salman says that given that Qatar and UAE have benefited, why can't I benefit from normalization of ties with Israel? If I normalize ties with Israel, Congress will stop calling me a pariah, from his perspective. I'm not saying Jews or Jews around the world. I'm not doing an anti-Semitic trope. I'm saying what Hamad bin Jassim, the former Qatari Prime Minister, said in 2018 in a France 24 interview. He said, quote, when the Arabs get close to the Israelis, it's not because they like the Israelis. It is because they believe that Israel is the key to Congress and the White House. Bin Salman says, look, I've come to power in 2017. When I came, everybody said, I'm a young star, I'm good, I'm, I'm, I'm a decent looking, I'm a reformer, I'm going to transform Saudi Arabia. Then he came to the US in 2018, he met Mark Zuckerberg, he met Oprah Winfrey, he met Elon Musk, he dressed up in a suit, he met the president. But then uh, Khashoggi needed the divorce papers to marry his wife Khadija and Bin Salman told him, you're welcome to come back to the kingdom, don't get the papers from Washington, come to Turkey because Turkey, in, in Turkey, Erdogan's word is law. It's not really a country. As much as I like Erdogan, I'm not blind to the way Turkey operates. It's not exactly a country of rule of law. They took him there. Khashoggi goes in and they assassinate Khashoggi. And the Turks say to the Saudis, like, this is leaking now. Are you guys going to do anything? The Saudis give uh, Erdogan the cold shoulder. So Erdogan runs riot and leaks everything. So the Khashoggi humiliates Mohammed bin Salman, so nobody wants to invest in Vision 2030. 2019, 2020, reputational risk. In 2020, when the reputational risk is lifting, when people are saying, Khalas Khashoggi is a thing of the past, the Houthis fire missiles at uh, Jeddah when Formula One is being held, and the, you're supposed to showcase Saudi to the world. So people say Saudi is unstable, nobody invests in Vision 2030. So bin Salman decides to start negotiating with the Houthis to get them to stop firing the missiles. When those negotiations start moving, another crisis. Biden comes to power and says, I won't work with a pariah. So 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, Vision 2030 is not going. Mariah Carey comes and still nobody's coming. Nicki Minaj is invited, she turns him down. I brought Pitbull and uh, David Guetta to do a rave in the desert and still nobody is coming. I went and I tried a bikini beach in Jeddah, still nobody is coming. I went and I changed the education curriculum. I made Islamic studies go from 38 hours in the week to 25 hours in the week and I told the world that I'm replacing those subjects with critical thinking and still people aren't coming. I reduced the volume of the Adhan now to 33% and I banned the loudspeakers from being used to recite Quran and people still aren't coming. I banned the broadcast of Tarawih prayers for every mosque in the kingdom and I almost did it for Mecca and Medina but these Muslims shouted too loudly so I, they made, I said okay allow for Mecca and Medina but Masjid Quba where Muhammad Ayyub was they can no longer broadcast Tarawih you can't listen to them anymore on your social media. I did all of that to show them that I'm serious about my reforms and still they won't come because now Biden has come to power and called me a pariah. Five years in power, Vision 2030 is not moving. He's tired, he's struggling. The economy is not diversifying. It's still reliant on oil. I need to diversify the economy, otherwise I'll go bankrupt the next time the oil price goes low. Biden comes the next year in Jeddah to plead for a reset in relations. But when he's in Jeddah, he does the one thing he's not supposed to do. He, he got, Biden comes out, and one reason why I love freedom, and I believe that Islam thrives in freedom, and why I believe that the UK is more Islamic than any of the Muslim countries in the Muslim world, because of the freedom that it affords, the free press of the United States, unlike the restricted press in Saudi Arabia, when Biden walks out of his meeting with bin Salman, they say, Mr. President, what about Khashoggi? What about Khashoggi? And Biden says, I told the crown prince, I brought the subject up, and I let him know who I think did it. And bin Salman panicked and the Saudi journalist came out and said that bin Salman told Biden, yeah, what about Shirin Abu Akla? And I'll be honest with you, when I heard that bin Salman brought up Shirin Abu Akla, even me, I went, touche, you know, well done. Like, that, that, that's a good uh, hit of bin Salman. The point is, by November, bin Salman cuts oil production to try to punish Biden, to bring the, oil pri the gas prices up, so Biden is punished. My point here is, 
end of 2022, Bin Salman's been in power for almost six years and Vision 2030 is not moving. So Bin Salman turns around and says, forget it, let me just do what UAE and Qatar do. Ta'ala Netanyahu, I'm ready to normalize ties with you because please, the Iranians have surrounded me. My economy is not diversifying. The companies are not coming. I've done all these documentaries about how I want to build cities like Miami. I've done all of these reforms and still they keep treating me like a pariah. Netanyahu, I'll give you a deal of the century. I'll normalize ties if you can get these wretched Americans to appreciate my vision 2030 and come and invest because I don't want to go to China. I don't like Beijing. I don't want to build a city that looks like Shanghai. I don't want to build a cold city that looks like Moscow. But Russia is not even a big economy. I want to build a city that looks like you. I'm only flirting with China because I'm upset with the Americans. Netanyahu, if I normalize ties, will the Americans give me what I want? Netanyahu went to Washington and said, guys, Bin Salman is offering to normalize ties with me. And Biden said, what does he want? He wants a NATO security agreement, nuclear technology, and he wants Health Vision 2030. Biden said, I'm not sure. Netanyahu said, yalla, 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 it's a golden opportunity. Just give it to him. Yalla. Biden said, I don't know if Congress will approve. He said, forget Congress. Just give him, a, send the fifth fleet and give him the security protection. But what about the nuclear weapons? Do you really want to give Saudi Arabia nuclear weapons? Just give him the nuclear technology. He's about to normalize ties with us. And bin Salman says, okay, Netanyahu tell me meets him in Saudi Arabia, he goes on a secret visit to Tehran and Sanafir, he goes and he meets with bin Salman, he comes back, he meets him again, Benny Gantz uh, complains that the Israelis leaked the visit, they said don't put Saudi in a difficult situation, Israeli sports teams are invited to participate in the kingdom in sports events, they enter with Israeli passports, the Israeli national anthem is raised at the e, at the e sports events in Saudi Arabia, because Saudi Arabia wants to be a leader in video games, in FIFA, and the Xbox, and, and these things, mashallah. I need to learn how to play FIFA again, it seems. But the point is that, from Bin Salman's perspective, with the economy not moving the way it is, with this diplomatic isolation, international isolation, we're all sitting in the room now with Bin Salman. When Bin Salman asks you, are the Palestinians worth compromising all of that? What's your answer? The UAE, we talked about it, they normalize ties, they say the US has been quiet. Then we get to Egypt, which is slightly different. Egypt has a very unique problem. The army's grip on the economy is so tight that there is no innovation in the economy. Egyptians don't want to start new businesses. They say there's no point. I start new businesses and then some son of a general is going to come and take my business anyway. My dream is to go to Europe and never come back to Masr. Maybe not all Egyptians, but I'll tell you about Tunisians. I'll tell you an anecdote. I know anecdotes are bad form, but this is, you'll enjoy this one. In 2014, I went to Qairawan in Tunisia to try to tell people to go to vote. Sisi did his coup. And when he did his coup, I was terrified. That was the end of the Arab Spring. So I went to Tunisia and I went to Qairawan. Qairawan is the next province next to where I am in Sidi Bouzid. There's Qairawan. And I went to Qairawan and I stood on a table in a cafe. Because in Tunisia, you can do that. You just walk in. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Then you get on the table. You know, you stand like that on the table. Ah, jma'a. Hey, hey, people. And of course, their days are quite boring. You know, they just sit drinking coffee or they say, okay, let's see what was happening here. And they watch you. And you say, yeah, ibadullah. The nation is in your hands now. Go and register to vote. Go and exert your power. Go and, you know, we can make Tunis better. It doesn't have to be like this. We don't have to be like the Egyptians. Sammy, Sammy, hey, 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 will damn me, hey, hey, cousin, wait. Just get to the point. How much are you giving us? What do you mean, how much am I giving you? Ajma, Raul, candidate X came this morning. He gave everybody 30 dinars. Did he come or did he come? He came, wallah, he came. Candidate B came after him, he gave everybody 50 dinars. He came, yes, he gave everybody 50 dinars. Sami, how much you given us? And like a naive Londoner, I told him, Yeah, Ibadullah, in Yabhathu and Shurafa, I'm looking for people of honor, people of integrity who love the country, who want to make it better. And wallahi, the guy responded to me and went, Arra! He comes from London suited and booted to talk to us about honor. Ask my Sammy, give everybody here visas to London. We'll all leave and you can keep this whole country to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> there was even a meme that went viral in 2014. They showed the departure gate of Qartaj Airport. Where the departure gate? <laughs> the, the, the meme writes on top. The ayah, Allahumma khrijna minha fa in udna fa inna zalimun. Allahumma take us out of this country. And if we ever return to it, truly we are the evil people. We are people who want to be ruined. 
Tunisia and Libya and these, you see the boats that try to cross the Mediterranean. They say, Sami, let me leave and I, and I don't come back. Tunis, I don't want to live in it. So Sisi has a problem in that many Egyptians give them a green card to America. They tell you, yeah, yeah, I got to America. When he's stuck in Egypt, he tells you, Masr, Umm Dunya. When he has the chance to leave, he tells you, hey, what? America. I saw a video of some of the migrants. Uh, there's a Moroccan on the border trying to cross over into America. He said, why are you crossing America? He says, I love America. I am ready to serve America. I am ready to, you know, because here they will treat me better than they treat me in my own countries. And, and to give you an indication as to how bad the despair is in some of these countries. In 2019, the presidential election was between Nabil Qarwi, who was considered from the corrupt business class, and between Qais Saeed, who turned out in the end to be someone who did a coup. But Qais Saeed was like an unknown at the time. So we were going around, and Nabil Qarwi used his charity. He would go around taking cardboard boxes of macaroni, tomato, cheese, to all the poor areas in Tunisia who were neglected for 10 years. So you can imagine, and I remember even my own auntie, she was like, Nabil Qarwi, has been nurse. he feels for people. He goes up the mountains to deliver, you know, these food and products to people who have been forgotten by the government. I was like, yeah, auntie, wallah, he's buying you out. Yeah, Sami, they ignored us. At least let somebody buy us out. You know, Adi, like, I accept it. So I remember going around from village to village around Sidi Bouzid, Qairawan, going across Tunisia. Tell them, yeah, Jema, come on, yeah, Jema. When they come to give you money, it's because they recognize you have a power that they want to control. Why don't you use that power? Why don't you take the money and, and vote how you want? La, la, Sami. And a sahab, amana. It's amana. He gave me the money. I have to vote the way that he wanted. <laughs> Wallahi, it's the truth. So one day I went. I had a, a brother who was with me who said to me, Sami, I've been traveling with you now across these areas in Tunisia now for two weeks. And okay, I confess, you're eloquent in Arabic, and yes, you are talking to people, but Sami, your approach is wrong. Rao, you're talking to a humiliated people. They only accept humiliation. When you talk to them with hope, they see it as weakness. For them to follow. You have to humiliate them and make them really see you as better than them for them to follow you. I told them, I can't do that to my own people. I never saw the Prophet Muhammad humiliate people. He told him, Sami, Jah Rabbi, I ask you, please, in the name of Allah, this next place that we go, please don't do the guys that the country's in your hands and go and vote kind of thing. Just humiliate them and just test it. And I promise you, it's an excellent election technique. I said, no way, Wajdi, I'm not doing it. So anyway, I went in the cafe. By this time, I'm tired. I'm feeling the pressure. I'm, you know, it's like, you know, you travel so far and the journeys on the road are so hard and the roads are really bad in Sidi Bouzid, you know. They're re I always say Tunisia, if you want to know it, land in Tunis, Qartaj, and drive from Tunis down to Sidi Bouzid. On the coastal cities, the roads are really lovely. They're really well done. Once you enter the inner regions of Tunisia, you can see it's all neglected. And all our prime ministers came from the coast and all the, everywhere, they all come from the coast. So anyway... So I'm spent one hour telling them, yeah, Jema'a, bled for you. And they're sitting looking at me like this. Like in France, I won't allow us. Like in America. This. Like in Anna, I read this conspiracy theory here and there. And they said, uh, yeah, but what are you going to do for us? And I got really angry. I said, I'm the one asking to help him. And he sits and looks at me arrogantly. I said, you know what? Anna, I'm the jahil. Wallah, Anna, I'm the stupid one. I left the luxury of London to come to this miserable place to try and help you. And I'm the idiot. Why would I leave London for this? Look at you. Your clothes are so dirty. It's disgusting. You like the slap of the police. You love the foot on top of your neck. You're the one who loves to be humiliated. When a free man comes and tells you be free, you don't want to be free. You want to be beaten. You love the humiliation. You deserve to be humiliated. You don't deserve karama you don't deserve dignity that's why they keep ruling over you like a dictatorship because it's you it's in Allah I even used an ayah you don't want to change yourselves Wallah, you, you have exactly what you deserve you did a revolution you don't deserve its fruits you don't deserve its results I get back on a plane I'm gonna go back to London and you can stay in your misery I'm the idiot Wajdi, let's go and Wallahi the whole cafe turned around and went you know what He's right. you're right. Uqsimu billah. Ahmed, kalam usheh, wallah. Wallah, kalam usheh. Asma, wild ammi, listen, cousin. Everyone here, everyone's vote is yours. Wallah, haran am'aak. You know what? We will get up now, we'll go with you to the next video. Uqsim billah, haran am'aak. And I went, what? And in that area, we won 100% of the vote. And do you know why I wept? Because it showed you how broken how broken they were that the message of hope doesn't resonate in their hearts. How broken they were.
that they could only resonate when you humiliated them. And that's why when you go to Egypt now with regards to Gaza and Palestine, Sisi has a crisis now in that Egyptians are not starting businesses. Egyptians are not trying. They say there's no point. The army just takes over everything. And the army is not running the economy properly. And when the, even the UAE, they poured 26 billion, them and the Saudis, and all that money got lost. So when the UAE told the army that, Khalas, we don't trust you to run these companies, you need to sell them to us and we'll run them for you. The army said no. UAE said we're not giving you any more money. So the army came up with a trick. They sold the assets of the company to another company, then sold the company with no assets to the UAE. So UAE withdrew funding from Egypt. So CC had a panic in that now he has to now listen to what the UAE and the IMF are telling him. What the UAE told him was, I need you to devalue the Egyptian pound. Stop supporting it with subsidies. CC thinks if he devalues the Egyptian pound, the Egyptians will protest and they'll revolt. What it means practically is when he devalues the pound, prices will skyrocket. And Sudan, the reason El Bashir was toppled was that when he lifted the subsidies in Sudan, the price of bread skyrocketed and fuel, and the Sudanese, they toppled him. And he'd been in power 30 years. Sisi is worried about that, which is why he did the election. When Gaza Palestine came about, Sisi said, Ya Lahui, why am I going to open the border and let all these Palestinians come in and I have an economic crisis on my hands? Who's going to look after these Palestinians when they cross the Rafah crossing? Uh, but then I'm not letting them cross these Rafah crossing. And Biden realized it was a problem. That's why Biden on the 20th of October announced he was presenting a bill to Congress where the Congress would pay Egypt millions of dollars and the Jordanians of taxpayers' money. He, Biden said to Sisi, Ya am he didn't say, he said, the, the, uh, don't worry, uh, Sisi. You're worried about the price of looking after the Palestinians, and we Americans will pay, the, will pay for the tents. We'll pay for the displacement. We'll pay for the ethnic cleansing. Itammin, don't worry. You'll be fine. CC said, there's no way I'm doing it. If I open Rafah crossing, even if you pay for it, I'll be condemned for history. Everybody will say I supported a Nakba. Wallah, I'm not opening the Rafah crossing. And then when the Europeans, von der Leyen, if you remember, she went to Cairo on the 22nd, 23rd. Von der Leyen went and said, we will also give you money if you open the crossing and you let the Palestinians come in. That's why Financial Times reported that Samah Shukri, the Egyptian foreign minister, told the European diplomats that Wallahi, and he actually said Wallahi, he said Wallahi, if you force us to take the Palestinians, we will put them all on boats and send them straight to Europe and you can deal them with your nonsense human rights. Now I don't think that's the nicest thing for a Muslim to say about fellow Muslims, but it is what it is. So Sisi refuses to open the Rafah crossing, not because, you know, he should. Even I'm not convinced if he should open the Rafah crossing. Because let me put it to you this way. If he opens the Rafah crossing and the Palestinian enter Egypt, do you think they will ever be allowed to go back to Gaza? When they leave Gaza and they enter Egypt, what do you think Netanyahu will immediately do? Annex Gaza. When he annexes Gaza and the Israeli settlers go in, do you think that they will allow the Palestinians to go back and live side by side with them? Absolutely not. What is Netanyahu's greatest problem now in Gaza? It's that the Palestinians are still there. Netanyahu's greatest crisis is that he keeps bombing Gaza, but the Palestinians are not going anywhere. And part of the reason they're not going anywhere, and I know this is, this is heartbreaking to say, and I'm not saying it in a positive way. I'm saying it solely as an analyst. And sometimes as an analyst, you just have to be amoral. Like, it's not about morality here. I'm not telling you it's the right approach. The question was, why aren't Egypt doing anything? I'm simply still saying amorally. I'm not saying it's the, right, it's, it's the right thing to do. I'm saying that keeping the Rafah border closed is part of the reason why Netanyahu is under so much pressure. Because Sisi refuses to give alternative land, so the Palestinians have nowhere to go, which means the atrocities are increasing, which means public opinion is shifting, which means Biden is threatening not to support Netanyahu, which means Netanyahu is racing against time to bomb the daylights out of Gaza, desperately trying to get that border open so that the Palestinians will cross over so he can annex Gaza. Sisi is a tyrant, yes, but in the more issue of the Rafah crossing, I actually don't know what he should do. And that's why I think that we should be wary in terms of how, what, what policies we're actually criticizing. Sisi has been offered money for taking in the Palestinians and he's rejected that money offer. They say that Sisi is trying to negotiate for a higher deal. But the reality is that with everybody threatening not to fund Sisi, it's hard to imagine what kind of deal Sisi will accept. Because even the Jordanians on the other side, remember they're under the same pressure to take in the Palestinians. The reason the Jordanian king is not doing so is for two reasons. The first, 50% of the Jordanian population are Palestinians. He will be toppled in an instant if he's seen to be taking a stance that's 
you know, facilitating a Nakba. The second reason is that King Abdullah of Jordan believes that he has no real international support. The Saudis tried to do a coup on him last year. For those who don't know, the Jordan King's half-brother tried to do a palace coup with Saudi's man in Jordan. And King Abdullah found out and imprisoned his half-brother and the like. And the Saudis came and apologized. Why? Because the Saudis want King Abdullah to hand over the custodianship of Al-Aqsa to Saudi Arabia. Bin Salman, who invited Iggy Azalea to twerk in Riyadh and who invited Nicki Minaj, wants to be the custodian of Mecca, Medina, and Al-Aqsa. May Allah never let him see the day. Never. I, part of my job, for those who don't know, my job is basically to advise companies how they can save money and not be hurt by the political events. Don't judge me. You learn a lot doing this job. I'll be honest with you. It's, it's really fascinating. But also part of my job is I'm, I'm asked sometimes by a number of foreign ministries, including the State Department here in the US, to give my opinion on things that's happening in the Middle East. In one of the discussions with the European diplomats, one of the European diplomats asked me a very interesting question. They said, do you think bin Salman will hand over Al-Aqsa to the Israelis? And I said, Allah. My reaction was not immediately yes. My reaction was, yani ma'gula, yani, yani. okay, I get it, okay, fine. Like he's doing some funky stuff in Saudi Arabia, but to hand over Al-Aqsa to the Israelis is a bit. And I said, where did you get this from? They said, because when we talked to the Israeli delegation, they told us that Al-Aqsa will be handed over to them. I said, what do you mean they told you? They said, no, Sammy, like they didn't say it to us like it's a maybe. They spoke to us as if like it's absolutely certain that Al-Aqsa is going to be handed over once normalization with Saudi Arabia happens. And that's why I think they're pressuring Jordan's king. Because UAE has been buying land from Palestinians and giving it to the Israelis. That's why Palestinians, if you notice, they no longer sell to UAE. They no longer sell land to the UAE. And I thought it was just a rumor. And then my Palestinian friends came back from Bethlehem. And they said, no, we absolutely don't sell to UAE anymore. Because when we, there, was, there were families that sold to UAE. And the next day, Israeli settlers were in the house. And they said, yeah, it had been sold to them. Because UAE believes that what the Ummah needs is not justice or, or this stuff about 1,400-year-old book becoming a constitution or the like. For those who think that I'm accusing UAE of something, there's an article, uh, Muhammad bin Zayed, the dark prince of the Middle East, where he tells US officials that if a man wants to stand up in Mecca and say, I'm the Mahdi, 80% of my army would go and join this Mahdi guy. That's the way he put it, not me. So the UAE buying land, because the UAE believes that what the Ummah needs is not dignity. It's money. If you have a job and you have money in your pocket and you're able to go 9 to 5 and then after 5 o'clock go to the cinema, go to the mall, go and enjoy yourself kind of thing, you won't ask about rights and, and polit policies and the like. You know, they even have some mashaykh sometimes, I've heard them. They say, look, the essence of ruling is feed them like cattle and give them stability and they won't ask you for political rights. UAE believes that the problem is not that there is no freedom. The problem is that bin Ali did in Tunisia didn't know how to build a Dubai or Abu Dhabi. I will build a Dubai for them. I'll build it for them in Khartoum and build them whatever. And then these Muslims will stop talking to me about rights and they will accept that I should be the ruler. That's UAE's vision. And that's why I think that when it comes to why Egypt and these countries aren't moving, each of these countries believes at the end of it, and this is where I wrap up, I promise. The, uh, each of these countries believe that at the end of the day, their interests are not worth compromising for the Palestinians because one, the Palestinians are not going to go anywhere. They, they say, okay, 15,000 die. Palestinians, Qawm and Jabbarin, they're going to stay there. Not out of love, but out of very crude so they believe that the palestinians will survive they'll be able to survive the israeli onslaught while we still get our nato style security agreement nuclear nuclear technology we still get support for vision 2030 we still keep the americans on board we can still say that we supported the israelis we still allow israel to fly over our airspace we don't kick out any israeli ambassadors we've shown our, that we're committed to the abraham accords why should we move and the dark tragedy is when you put it like that it makes some sense, even if it is so disgusting and crude. And the reason why I think it is disgusting and crude is, I don't think Allah will reward it, because in Surah Hud, we always assume that the prophets went to weak societies, that they went to poor societies. But when you look at how Allah describes the people of Hud, or Ad and Thamud, that they used to create things that were never created before them, that they were numerous, that they were, they were powerful people that Allah sent prophets to. So economically, they were prosperous. They had their own vision, I don't know, 600 BC. They had their own, they, they achieved it. They achieved economic prosperity. They were powerful nations. But why did Allah destroy them? Because they were unjust. 
Because Ibn Khaldun says al adlu asas al mulk. And that's why I believe that it won't work. It's because it's a sunnah, it's a qaida that Allah has made in sunnah al-bashar, in the human race. And that's why Ibn Taymiyyah said that Allah will preserve a disbelieving state that is just, but will destroy a Muslim state that is unjust. For Allah can tolerate kufr with justice, but cannot tolerate Islam with injustice. And that's what I meant earlier when I said that when I go to London, for example, and I spent some time in Tunis, in Tunisia, in my hometown. When I go to London, for example, if I stand in front of a judge, Suella Braverman, who was the Home Secretary, was trying to deport immigrants from the UK to Rwanda. The reason she couldn't is because one judge said no. One judge said no. Rule of law. When I go in front of a judge in the UK, I promise you, for all of the racism that exists, the judge literally judged based on the papers that's in front of him and based on the law. When I was in Tunisia, to get the proof that my father owned the house in the village, I spent one week pleading with Muhammad and Sarah and Fatma and this, telling them, yeah, wild ammi a'tini jid waldin jid bul paper. Give me the, 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 the paper that says that I am a resident, I have my ID card. He tells you, ah, I have to call Tunis, because he's waiting for the, the, the bribe to go in. And then when you tell him afterwards and you're walking out, because Jalal calls you and says, Asma Sam, you're doing it all wrong. And I, I know we, Sam who works in the, in the thing, he'll sort it out for you. And I'm tired at this point. I'm like, khalas, let's go with Fasad. We Sam, please give me the paper. We Sam gives the paper. And I turn around the thing and I go, may Allah never bless every one of you. May Allah condemn everyone. Sammy, what's wrong with you? May Allah never make your affairs easy because you made my affairs difficult. This wasn't about Tunis. You say the state is corrupt. You treated me badly. You had the paper and you refused to give it to me. When I compared the two experiences, I said, listen, wallahi, that's what I mean by sometimes. Justice is a beautiful and lovely thing and injustice makes you hate even your own brethren. Because that guy in the Sidi Bouzid office didn't need, it wasn't a, a government problem. It was him. He didn't want to give me the paper. And he wasted one week because I desperately needed to pay an electricity bill and I wasn't allowed to pay it because I had to prove that I had the right to reside in the house in the village. And I needed the guy just to give me a stamp and he refused to give me the stamp. Whereas in the UK, I could have done it online in five minutes. And that's what I mean by justice and injustice. So to answer your question, they believe the Palestinians will survive and it's not worth compromising the interest for it. Jazakallah khair uh, uh, for giving us the answer of one question in exactly 56 minutes. I, I really appreciate uh, the wisdom. And, and you, you see, we must appreciate that we as Muslims, we are very emotional. We, we take things on, on the basis of our emotions. But the takeaway from, from the answer of the first question is that we, we need to be actively participant of the system. We need to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has blessed us to be in a country where justice, rule of law prevails. We have freedom of expression. We can, we can speak the truth. And unfortunately, with the recent events that have uh, put us on a back foot, where we are, we feel like that we are back in our home countries where we are reluctant to speak, what to speak, what not to speak, and that is the fear that we need to get that one out of our way. The country that allows us to be lawful citizen and deem, be expressive of our, uh, our rights, that's why we, we are grateful that some of our volunteers who are running for the office, it's not an easy task. Uh, and obviously, we're not here to endorse anyone, any party or any individual, but we, we want to thank our community member, Brother Brother Sam, for running for the city of uh, Dallas Sheriff's Office. And as Brother Sammy has uh, rightly mentioned, that because we are 501c3, all opinion expressed by the speakers are his personal. Obviously, we are not endorsing any party or any candidates, but just let those information sink in. It's very, very important that we get those information, the analysis sink in, and then make our wise decision. We cannot... I really like the example of humiliation that he used. And, and that's where we are at this time. You know, when we had our meeting with the DOJ and the FBI, we were told, you know what is your biggest problem is when you start coming complaining that your Muslims are facing this? You guys do not complain. We don't file reporting. 
any incident that take place anywhere we need to report. We make sure that we utilize the system that is available to us. S election is one system. Calling agencies is another system. If you are facing with the anti-Semitism or Islamophobia or xenophobia or any racial slurs or comments, it is obligation on us to make sure we file reporting so that it doesn't happen to the person who is sitting next to me. Because we come from the country where we feel that it's not happening to me, so I'm okay. Mm -hmm. That's not the right approach. So with that, I am going to abstain asking any more questions, but I will open the floor to the audience if anybody wants to ha have any question to Brother Sami. And uh, let's make those questions precise. You can, you can, you know, you're not allowed to boycott Israel and all that stuff. You know, and this is, uh, this is a lot of boys. You can boycott your own country with the U.S. product and all that, but not, not the, you know, the, in the state of Israel. I just want to know what you guys' opinion on that, how, how you can also fight such a thing. The brother is asking, may Allah preserve Zeki and I, I grew up watching him and Ahmed Dad. When it comes to the boycott, I think one of the things that the, the problems that they have in implementing that law is how do you prove that somebody is boycotting the products? If I don't want to buy Israeli products because I believe that the Turkish company Bodrum produces better goods, how are you going to prove that I was boycotting the Israelis in the first place? And that's why I think that the biggest issue that they have with this law is it was a symbolic gift to the Israelis but very difficult to implement itself. And even those who've been convicted under those laws, the reality is that they struggle to prove those convictions with regards to it. And that's why I'm not too concerned necessarily about the law that encourages the boycott. What I will say as well is, always, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, when to uddu ni'matallahi la tuhsuha. If you were to count the blessings of Allah, you'd never finish counting them. The reality is that you guys are in a society where you don't get punished for tweeting. You don't get like, in Saudi Arabia, somebody put a tweet with 10 followers, he's being threatened now with execution. You're not in a country where, for example, the, I have the friend, my wife went to give a speech in Istanbul, World Halal Summit. We run this travel company where we take people to different places around the world. So there was somebody there at the summit who said to her, Sumaya, tell Sami that I'm going to Umrah in December. And we received a WhatsApp that says, don't bring kafiyas, don't bring free Gaza stickers, and don't bring uh, free Palestine, and don't record yourselves making dua for Gaza in Saudi Arabia. I told the Sumaya, I can't do a video based on a rumor. Like, I don't have a, he didn't show you any proof. And then I was sitting in LA, lovely LA with its lovely weather and... 27 degrees Celsius and, and when they took me out of LA to fly me to Chicago I said to this the brothers they said welcome to Chicago I told them well your brothers have no shame how could you pull me out from LA and bring me here to Chicago we could have done this via zoom <laughs> in any case because I come from London London we have five days of summer but anyway and to see that weather in November subhanallah but anyway I was sitting in LA having dinner and I said guys I've heard uh, this rumor that in Saudi Arabia now when you go for Umrah you're not allowed to record yourselves making dua for Gaza and you're not allowed to do free Gaza. I said, it sounds ridiculous. There's no way Bin Salman would do that. And one brother said to me, no, no, Sammy, it's true. Here's the WhatsApp message. Here it is. And it says, with a heavy heart, we inform you that we've been told by the Saudi authorities, no free Palestine, no Gaza. When I ask you guys here today, when I talk about your freedom of expression, your ability to communicate, your ability to say and talk for the sake of Palestine, believe me, you have more power here than anybody in the Ummah today. You have more power here to make the change than any part of the ummah. And I promise you, the reason Biden is buckling is because of you, not us in the UK. The reason Biden is panicking and telling Netanyahu, the reason they went from no ceasefire to pause, to humanitarian pause, to hostage truce, to sustainable ceasefire, as they're saying now, is not because Netanyahu and Blinken said, haram what we're doing to the Palestinians. It's because a pressure was brought to bear that didn't come from Saudi Arabia, didn't come from Egypt, didn't come from Jordan, didn't come from Erdogan in Turkey who keeps telling the Israelis, I don't want to work with Netanyahu, I don't want to work with Netanyahu, but I work with the Israelis, not Netanyahu, not Netanyahu. It came because of you, because here, despite the pressure that you are under, there is still a system of law that guarantees your right to continue speaking for the sake of the Palestinians, that guarantees your right to express your views on social media, that guarantees 
use your right to amplify the Palestinian voice on social media. And no matter how much they try to repress that, they are unable to do so because there is still a system of law over here. And not only that, for those who believe the system is rigged, Biden doesn't seem to believe the system is rigged in his favor because he's panicking that he's going to lose an election in November. And that's why I think a lot of it is about perspective and changing that mentality in that you have the ability here, boycott as you wish. The, the views expressed are those of the speaker and not those of, of the organization that has hosted me or asked me. This is a very important caveat. My visa is valid until 2028. Please renew it. And just as you hope the Muslims will forget in November, I hope you forget before 2028 as well. And uh, please allow me to go through the border smoothly. But that's the point that I want to make in that Keep going as you are. You are making a difference. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And I promise I'll finish on this point. When the pressure comes to bear on you, remember always the rule in politics. The stronger the repression, the greater the perceived threat. If they perceive the threat to be strong, the repression becomes stronger. You don't repress something that is not a threat. So you might think that repression means that they're making you weaker. No, the repression is an acknowledgement that you're getting stronger. And you need to appreciate and recognize that because that's the only way you continue making a difference for Gaza. Last question. Right. Assalamu alaikum. So I'd like to thank you for the speech. I found it very eye-opening, even if I disagree with a couple points here and exactly. there. But my main question is, with the more I look into the situation, the more like I feel a sense of hopelessness that comes to mind. So I look, I look at like how Israel just like can do whatever it wants to the Palestinians and there's no possible pushback it can come from it. Like even when you come to the US, like you know, both parties here are just completely on this, fanatically on the side of Israel and there's not really that much that can do to change it. So my simple and very naive question is, how can Palestine be free with everything that's going on? In 1945, uh, France was liberated from Nazi Germany as a result of US intervention and the Allies and the like. So France, they celebrated in Paris and then there was this wonderful document that was drawn up. It was called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Geneva Convention. And clause one said every man is born free. Clause two said every people have the right to self-determination. And the Allies sat on the table and they said, look how wonderful we are, our values. Look how noble we are. Look at how excellent we are. Look at this lovely document that we've made. Look how just and wonderful we are. So the Algerians, where my maternal, where my mother is from, the Algerians in Stif Galman Kharata, they heard about this document and they said, you know what, mashallah, asma khoyak, al document adi. Did you hear about this uh, document? This man might apply to us. Let's go and ask for our own independence based on this document. They took to the streets and the French said, what, how can these people believe this document belongs to them? What's going on over here? They summoned their generals. They summoned militias from Senegal. They sent them all the way to Algeria and they massacred 30,000 Algerians in one week to tell them, you guys, this document doesn't belong to you. France is superior here. And the view of the French was that after that 30,000 massacre, the Algerians would never again take to the streets to resist. We taught them such a bloody lesson. We taught them, we made the rivers of blood. We made the blood flow on the streets. We taught the Algerians that resistance is futile, that when you stand up against France, it's simply not worth it. Only one French general, only one in classified documents, warned them in Paris and he was laughed at. He said, guys, I've bought you 10 years with this massacre, but this is a turning point and I don't think we'll be able to come back from it. And they told him, what are you talking about? These are uncivilized backwards people. You know, we're still liberating their women from the hijab. Allah had written that after that massacre, which was so horrific and shocked the Muslim world, 17 years later, France would be kicked out of Algeria, despite the Algerians never being militarily superior to the French at any point in the liberation movement. That's just the way history operated. When you look at the Muslim world 90 years ago, how it was under official colonization, if I was to ask you today why there's no official colonization, would you say it's because the British suddenly had a crisis of conscience and said, let's withdraw? Would you say it's because the French suddenly woke up and said, fraternité, liberté, and laïcité, and let's give everybody their rights and let's just withdraw from Vietnam and withdraw from Algeria? Was it because the Italians who had massacred the Libyans and executed Omar Mukhtar said we're so heartbroken by the execution of Omar Mukhtar, we're going to retreat and give Libyans their authority? No. 
the reason that official colonization is not the foundation of the global order as it was 90 years ago is because an ummah that was considered incapable, weak, and did not have the resources managed to turf those superpowers out of those territories. I'm not giving you something that is some sort of bombastic speech or the like. I'm telling you something that happened less than 100 years ago. I'm telling you something the Ummah did less than 100 years ago, and I'm telling you about something of a people that I was lucky enough to meet because my grandfather, Allah Rahmo, died when I was 15. I got to sit with him and hear the stories. I got to hear him say that when we were in the mountains fighting, we never believed we would see independence. We were convinced the French were military superior, but we had no other choice but to keep fighting. And subhanAllah, he has sent me to me, in uh, five years later, we got our independence. Incroyable. He didn't say Ankurayab, he didn't like the French too much. But he said, you know, like, subhanAllah, you know, it shows you how Allah operates. In 1980s, in South Africa, apartheid, the African states that had been liberated from the Western influences, like Zimbabwe and these other places, they announced that they were going to put sanctions on South Africa. They were part of the Commonwealth. Margaret Thatcher summoned them to London and said, I oppose these sanctions. This is 1987. They said, we're going to impose these sanctions with or without you. At that time, there was a lot of media coverage of South Africa and people were beginning to turn against the tide against South Africa and public opinion was shifting. Even in the UK, when they saw the reality of apartheid as a result of allies who were alongside the ANC, white allies who were documenting it, they ended up and the public opinion started shifting. Margaret Thatcher held out for seven months and then allowed this and then the sanctions took place on South Africa and Mandela became president in 91. What I'm saying is, that the process is never easy, and it's always turbulent, and it's always difficult, it's always painful, it's always full of despair, and it's always very hurtful. That's the reality of it. And one of the reasons why I think that we should, be, that we should say, Alhamdulillah, we are Muslim, is because Allah gives you those examples, even in the Quran, before even the examples of apartheid and, and, and Algeria. When you read Surah Hud and you open it, let's be brutally honest, not a single prophet in Surah Hud succeeds in convincing his people. Hud salam goes, Allah destroys his people. Shu'ayb goes to Median, Allah destroys Median. Salih goes to his people, Allah destroys them. Nuh goes to his people, Allah destroys them. Lut goes to his people, Allah destroys them. Not a single prophet succeeds. But would you say that those prophets failed? Why? What is it that makes you believe those prophets didn't fail? It's because you don't believe that their role was to achieve the outcome. You believe their role was to strive and struggle. It's because you accept that the outcome subconsciously, you accept that the outcome only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only Allah decides the outcome and therefore your role is not the outcome. What Surah Hud is telling you is your role is the striving. Your role is to keep going. Because those who achieved the liberation of Algeria didn't achieve it by their own efforts alone. They achieved it by the efforts of those who came before them and never saw the liberation of Algeria. When you read the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what if I was to tell you that Musab ibn Umayr radiallahu ta'ala an, the first diplomat of Islam who goes to Yathrib and convinces Yathrib to become Medina al-Munawwara, he never sees Fath Makkah. He dies before it. Does that mean Musab ibn Umayr failed? Absolutely not. Would Yathrib have been converted had Musab ibn Umayr not gone to Yathrib? No, because Allah chose Musab ibn Umayr for that purpose. Allah made his whole life's purpose to achieve that goal and brought him back to Jannah. If you were to meet Musab ibn Umayr today and you were to tell him, would you have preferred what Allah has given you in Jannah or to see Fatah Makkah? What do you think Musab ibn Umayr would say to you? To see Jannah. And that's why I always say that when you look at the despair of what's unfolding in front of you, yes, it's true, we're all heartbroken. But the way I calculate it is this. Do I have an army to go rescue Gaza? No. Do I have oil to cut off to force the oil prices up? No. Do I have a diplomat to lobby and get an alliance? No. Is my conclusion to go home and sit at home? What do I have? Bifadlillahi wa rahmatih. A group of people came and invented social media. May Allah give them the highest Jannah. Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey, these people. And I mean it sincerely. May Allah guide them to Islam and give them the highest Jannah because this decentralization of information is phenomenal. When I see blink and buckle because of social media, in Algeria there's a phrase, we call it the Skara. It's even in Tunisia as well they have it. Skara is when you see something, you don't like somebody, and you see something that annoys him. So you keep doing it. Just you say, I have no interest in this matter, but I'm going to keep doing it. When I see that social media upsets Netanyahu, I might not believe 
that social media will bring an impact. But Netanyahu is upset about it. You all agree, Netanyahu is upset. Then Skara Fiha retweet. When Blinken, when I see him, that he wants to restrict social media and shadow ban accounts. Maybe social media won't bring about liberation. But Skara Fiha, I'll, do it. I'll sit on nighttime on TikTok and I'll keep reposting him. I tell my wife sometimes as a joke. She says, why are you still on your phone? I tell I'm doing jihad, Sumayya. And I mean it. I mean it. I tell I'm doing jihad. Fi sabilillah. I'm retweeting to make sure that everybody sees the Palestinian video. Retweet, ajr, like, ajr. One day I said to her, do you think that like is one hasanat and retweet is two hasanat? <laughs> do you think a quote tweet is ten hasanat? Because I, you know what I mean? Like, do, do, do you think, and she said to me, are you taking the make? I said, wallah, I'm being serious. Do you think Facebook, because it's not as popular as Twitter, is maybe like, you know, it's, it's, it's the lower form, it's adha'af al-iman, and that I should take TikTok more seriously? Do you think I should go to Baba and tell him, Baba, you should take TikTok more seriously? Instagram. I, I don't know how to use Instagram very well, you know. I only got, you got onto it recently. How do you use this story stuff? Do you think stories is 15 hasanat and post is only one? Because people don't read the feed anymore. They only read the stories. You start thinking in these regard. And I truly believe Allah is rewarding you. And I tell you the proof. Because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, if he cannot, the Prophet doesn't say if you don't want to. The Prophet Sallallahu said that if you have no power to change it with your hand, the Prophet is acknowledging Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that there will be scenarios where you don't have the power to change it with your hands. Does the Prophet Sallallahu say in the hadith, then go home? Does he say don't do anything? He says no, he says then bili sane. And if he cannot, if he's too scared, he loses his job, if he's too scared, or, or that kind of thing, then be qalbe, condemn it in your heart, but beware, that's the weakest of faith. So when I read that hadith, I think, to be honest, social media is an elevated form of resistance. We're talking. This is bilisane. You know, you're trying to say, okay, good, can I translate it into Urdu, get the Pakistanis on board? Can I translate Turkey? I take, guys, this, is this Google Translate correct for Turkey so I can get pressure on Erdogan as well, you know, can I, can I, and, and I know, I can see people chuckling, but I, this is, this is true, this is exactly how I feel it is, because it's the only power that I have, and what I found, and this is where I wrap up, what I found is this, when in the beginning what happened in Gaza, and we sat, and I tell him, I say about me specifically, you know, you sit watching the TV and you're weeping with tears at what's happening in Gaza, and then my wife walks in and she sees that I'm horribly depressed at what's happening in Gaza, and then she says to me, Sammy, look, why do you sit here and do nothing? Go and do something. al haq you're not helping me with the dishes or with the hoover. And you're not helping me with Selma's homework either. So please either be useful and stop moping around. Go and record a video and just go and talk. Yeah, and you never know. Go shout at the camera or something. And I went in front of the camera. You know, Netanyahu is terrified. Netanyahu is desperate. His political, and I meant it, his political future is whatever. Then Muhammad Jalal calls me. He says, come on the Thinking Muslim podcast and talk on it. So he was doing it, effort, I was doing it, effort. Allah felt that he should connect those dots. I wasn't planning it, neither did he plan it. Allah felt, let's connect those efforts. I did the Thinking Muslim podcast. Those at Yaqeen Institute, they saw it. They said, this is an interesting angle. So Allah decreed that on the other side, fi akhir dunya, this place that's far away from the rest of the world, Allah decreed that our efforts would join together. And I did the Yaqeen podcast. And I lost my temper because of that horrible question that sister asked. In the middle, after that, Sheikh Mikhail speaks, I lost my temper, and then I got a WhatsApp message, just keep going, don't worry about your portion. After the Yaqeen thing finished, I got the invitation here to come to Mass LA. I thought, exciting, let me go see these American Muslims, if they realize that Allah has made it so that they are 1% of the population, but he's put 51% power in their hands, because they have the ability now to punish genocide Joe. Let me see if in their eyes, they realize they have this golden opportunity, or if they're going to buckle and go and vote for genocide Joe again, and say, yeah, Biden, Adi, no problem. Go and massacre the Palestinians, because we're too scared what Trump is going to do to us over here. Let me see if the Americans perhaps are considering a third option, which is that you tell the Democrats absolutely that you will not vote Biden, and I don't think the governor of Pennsylvania or somebody will wait until November to lose his seat if he's convinced it's certain defeat. I think they can change the Biden ticket. It's possible by February they say, guys, why are we going for headed for certain defeat? Biden is behind Trump in all of those states. And the Muslims are telling us that they're absolutely not going to vote Biden. Why should we wait for defeat? Let's just change Biden and bring another candidate in place. And then the world will say that the Muslims toppled a sitting U.S. president. Now some Muslims, may Allah forgive them, may Allah forgive them. They are saying to me, Sami, what if the other candidate is worse? 
Yeah, there's a genocide taking place and Biden is supporting it. We haven't even won the first battle and you're asking about if he's going to be worse. And plus, why is the Zionist lobby so feared in this country? It's not because they deliver candidates. It's because they punish candidates. It's because when you speak out against them, they get you sacked. When you speak out against them, they get you toppled. Why can't we show that same power that we're able to punish people as well? Imagine how people review the Muslim community if for the first time we show that we can also punish candidates like the Black Caucus and like the Zionist lobby. The victory is not in who comes next. The victory is in we are able to topple anybody who supports genocide. That's the victory how you mobilize. That's what makes you determined in terms of moving forward. So when I went to Mass LA and I went and I said, and I said, mashallah, or do these Muslims believe it? I saw half Muslims committed, half with fear in their eyes. And I said to them, I appreciate it. I'm going to go be living in London. I'm not the one who's going to tolerate Trump for four years. It's up to you guys what you choose to do. And then they said, come back to Dallas al-Sharif. And I was always excited to see Dallas al-Sharif because it seems such a good hub for Muslims, mashallah. Such a concentration of scholars and Islamic schools and that kind of thing. I'm quite excited to be here and the weather's been quite pleasant as well, mashallah. As well. But the point is that you get to see it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took it from depressed on the couch to sitting in front of you in Dallas. Now the reason I'm saying it, I know the Arabs say Udbin Kalimat Anna. What I'm saying is, look how I didn't plan this route, but Allah brought all our efforts together so that we're sitting here today and bouncing off each other. You think that you've come here to listen to me. I've come here to see you. Think about it from my perspective. I've flown from the other side of the world 13 and a half hours on a plane where the seatbelt sign was on for most of the flight because that 787 Dreamliner was shaking in the air to such an extent I said Shahada probably 20 times. And then the captain walked out while the plane is being, you know, buffeted in the air with the wind. And I said, yeah, inna lillahi. Uh, captain, what are you doing? Arja, get back in your cockpit. <laughs> I flew to the other side of the world. And I'll and, and I be honest with you. Like, and, and I say this from a personal perspective. When I look at you coming from London, I find it extraordinary that the message of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu left the desert of Arabia. I can understand it reaching London, but I find it phenomenally reached here. I find it phenomenal that you guys have made roots here. I find it phenomenal that you have power here. I find it phenomenal you have influence here. I find it phenomenal that you're the fastest growing religion here. I find it phenomenal that you have all these committees and organizations. I find it phenomenal that you have these wonderful complexes. I find it phenomenal you build basketball courts next to your masajid. I find it phenomenal that you build all these seminaries and the like. And what I find even more strange though is that you have all of these blessings and you've built all of these things and you have all of these powers and still you look at me as if somehow the ummah is weak. What I don't understand is how you achieve all of these gains, all of these advances, that now the highest levels of state are concerned that you will punish them in the elections and you look at me with eyes that suggest, Sammy, I feel weak. What I don't understand is why I sit with diplomats who say that Biden is going to get screwed over by the Muslims. But when I go to the Muslims, I think, what is the power that these diplomats see in my Muslim brothers and sisters that it, from their eyes, they don't seem to be seeing that power? What is the power that Netanyahu fears in you that he wants to shadow ban your accounts and to limit the reach of your hashtag Palestine? What is the power he sees in you that you have yet to see in yourself? What is the power that Blinken feels he has to go to bin Salman to get a fatwa from Abdurrahman al Sudais when Blinken has no idea what fatwa is about? He has to go get a fatwa from Abdurrahman al Sudais to get you to be quiet. Why does Blinken fly thousands of miles to bin Salman and then talks to Abdurrahman al Sudais to get you to be quiet? What is the power Blinken fears that you will manifest that you are unable to see in yourself? That's why the tragedy of this ummah, wallah al azim is not that it's weak, it's that it believes it's weak when everybody else believes it to be strong. Why do you think the ummah is being repressed? The ummah is being repressed because when they colonized the ummah, the ummah got its freedom. And then when they tried to repress the ummah, the ummah brought about the Arab Spring. And then when the ummah did the Arab Spring, now there is chaos. People are saying that the chaos means that we're weak and it's disastrous. Chaos comes about when one power is unable to fully subjugate the other. Chaos means that the repressive power is now weak and incapable of repressing the other power and therefore chaos has, is the result of that flux in the dynamics of power while everybody wrestles with each other to decide who will be superior. Once upon a time, we had the chains on our necks. We ripped off those chains and now we're fighting to get rid of the other chains as well. And this is where I finish on this point to say, Ya Ibadallah, I promise you, Beware the subconscious assertion in your heads that there is a power other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Beware the assertion that the ummah is weak. For wallahi, Allah is qawiyun dhul arsh al-majid. Allah is the one who has all of the power. Allah decides where to deploy that power as he wishes, when he wishes, how he wishes. Allah's power is never reduced 
in any time whatsoever. But to unlock that power in our favor, Allah makes one demand of us. He says, move. He says, mobilize. Take one step to Hadith Qudasi. Take one step towards me. I take 10 steps towards you. The reason Allah takes 10 is to say, when you take one step, I'll make sure you don't make 10 mistakes. I will prevent those 10 mistakes by coming 10 steps towards you. When Allah says, Woman arad al akhirata wa sa'a laha sa'ya wa huwa mu'minun, fa'ulaika kanat sa'yuhum mashkura. That those who strive for the akhirah, wa huwa mu'minun, they are striving in the belief that Allah is in, the charge of the, in charge of the outcome. That's why they're striving. They're striving in the sense of Allah, I don't know which direction to go. I don't know what the outcome is. But ya yeah, Allah, I know you told me to move, I'm moving. They told me to go to a protest, I'm going. I don't know if it's going to be useful or not. They told me to go listen to Sami. He just loud mouth shouts on camera. I don't know if he's useful or not. But I'm going anyway because I, I, I know I should be moving. Allah, Sami told me to retweet and to, I don't believe retweeting makes a difference, but you told me to move. Allah, I'm moving. I'm hoping that you'll come 10 steps and show me how this is going to be amplified. Allah says move. Those who do, wahuwa mu'minun, they believe that Allah is in charge of the outcome. Allah doesn't say the result is rewarded. He says, fa'ulaika kana sa'yuhum mashkura. It's their striving that is rewarded because what Allah is saying, ya ibad Allah, mobilize, but remember the outcome belongs to me. And you may not see the outcome in your lifetime. We may not see the liberation of Palestine in our lifetime. But what if I was to say to you 